After both of her parents passed away, Ana Belen Pintado decided to make some room in her garage. While doing so, she discovered some medical documents and a letter from her mother's doctor. The note, which was written six years before Anna was born, said that her mother could not have children due to a uterine abnormality and clogged fallopian tubes. This made Anna very curious, so she looked through the papers some more and found her birth certificate, which indicated that her mother had given birth to a girl in a maternity clinic in Madrid. The certificate stated her birth date and place of birth and even had a room number, except the top of the birth certificate had been torn off, which begged the question, what were they attempting to hide? At this point, Anna began to suspect she was a stolen baby. Anna had long been aware of the practice of newborns being abducted from Spanish hospitals. Spain had been one of Europe's most progressive nations up until the early 1930s, allowing both married couples to divorce and women to have abortions. Things took a dramatic shift when Spain's supreme leader, Francisco Franco, assumed office. He quickly started stripping social freedoms from the nation. Women lost many of the privileges they had gained under the Second Spanish Republic, which lasted from 1931 to 1939. And those rights were soon repealed under Franco. Both divorce and adultery were made illegal. Without the permission of their father or spouse, women were unable to open a bank account, obtain a job contract, or travel outside the country. It was expected that they would have a large family and maintain a traditional Catholic Spanish home. The stolen baby phenomenon was just one part of a national nightmare that began in Spain with Franco's rise to power. It developed into one of the most pervasive abuses of the time. Antonio Vallejo Najera, a prominent psychiatrist in Franco's administration who received his training in Nazi Germany, pushed the notion that the offspring of Franco's opponents possessed a Marxist red gene in the late 1930s and early 1940s. He suggested that by separating children from their mothers and placing them with conservative families, the gene may be suppressed. Large-scale kidnappings were shortly commenced by Franco's soldiers. Children left orphaned by Franco's killing squads and infants whose mothers had given birth while serving time for political crimes were among those who were targeted. They were all given to government supporters to raise. Unfortunately, this was just the start of the stolen baby era. With Franco in charge, the Catholic Church quickly grew more powerful, enabling its nuns and priests to take on the role of enforcing the new regulations. They set the rules for the educational system, mandating that students learn to read from the Bible while also receiving instruction in Catholic ideals. Franco also gave the church control over a portion of the state-run hospital system. Nuns frequently worked in hospitals alongside senior management, helping to choose employees and manage the budget. However, their impact was most likely felt on the hospital floors that housed the poor, as the nuns were frequently used there to persuade single moms to place their children for adoption with married couples. These babies weren't kidnapped from political detainees or orphans anymore. Instead, they came from the lower social groups who were led to believe they had no other option. The arrangement worked well for a while, but in the 1960s, with the entrance of tourism and international corporations, it attracted people with more liberal views, which boosted the country's economy and gave women more freedom. The women started to believe it was possible to survive as single mothers. This resulted in a decline in the baby supply. Naturally, the baby trade wasn't going to cease because it had already become such a big deal back then evolving from a scheme to destroy communist inclinations to a lucrative business industry, especially in illegal markets. According to the birth mothers, some nuns started kidnapping children to meet demand with the help of medical professionals like nurses, midwives, and doctors. Many mothers claimed they were forced to part with their newborns while others claimed they were sedated in the delivery room and then informed when they woke up that their babies had died, when in fact, the children had been discreetly sold to wealthy Catholic parents, many of whom were unable to have families of their own. The nuns did, however, manage to convince some mothers to give up their children willingly. The mystery of the crime committed by the adoptive families was buried beneath a mountain of false documents. Nobody knows exactly how many infants were abducted, although estimations point to tens of thousands. The abducted children were simply known as the stolen babies in Spain. Several children, now adults, are coming to the realization that the families they grew up in were never biologically theirs to begin with, and they may have just been one of Spain's stolen babies.
The first reports of newborns being sold in Spain were made public as early as the 1980s. In 1989, the headline of the front of a well-known women's magazine read, Baby Trafficking in Madrid. They took my daughter without letting me see her. A frantic woman described how a doctor named Eduardo Vela tried to get her to sign adoption paperwork after she awoke from delivery under anesthetic. She claimed that her infant was sold for 380,000 pesetas, or a few thousand dollars. The accounts were mostly disregarded, and it wasn't until victims started to appear, this time led by their grown-up children who were looking for their biological parents, that they began to see any progress. These victims formed organizations like the National Association for Irregular Adoption Victims, which calculated that up to 15% of adoptions in Spain between 1965 and 1990 were carried out without the birth parents' agreement. In 2011, the group brought its first legal action on behalf of 261 alleged kidnapping victims. As a result of the nationwide uproar that the filing generated, other people came forward and the number of cases increased to 747 in a month. Anna began asking her parents, friends, and neighbors for further information as she dug deeper to learn the truth about the circumstances of her birth. One family friend recalled little about Anna being adopted, other than the fact that Anna's father insisted no one should ever mention it to her. However, another family friend recalled that Anna's mother had mentioned that she had been asked to pretend to be pregnant by those involved in the adoption process and had paid a sizable sum of money for the adoption. Anna went on to request a copy of her civil registry record, which revealed that she had previously been registered with a last name other than her parents. At this time, she started looking for information outside of her close family and friends, which led her to an organization called SOS Stolen Babies, which is essentially a network of stolen babies hunting for their birth parents. From that point forward, Anna started sending letters to families with the same last name as hers, inquiring if they had lost a kid and if it might be her. This turned out to be a dead end, but fortunately for Anna, the topic of the abducted kid started to garner more attention from the media via talk shows. So she made the decision to appear on one of them to share her tale and solicit leads to aid in her quest. Through this method, Anna was able to finally receive the call that confirmed she was a stolen child and allowed her to be reunited with her long lost family of 45 years. Anna's mother recalled briefly holding a baby before having a mask placed over her face and losing consciousness. She was told by a doctor and nurse when she woke up that the baby was stillborn and that they would take care of the paperwork and burial, but she never realized that they had lied. After getting back together, the pair had a DNA test, which verified what they already knew. Maria Jose Robles Maria's mother was informed that one of her newborn twins had died, and like many other similar tales, she was never allowed to view the deceased child or bring it back home to be buried. The popularity of the stolen baby story made Maria and her parents realize that there were similarities to their own experiences. They started gathering information and discovered disparities, which prompted them to appear in court. The court ordered the exhumation of her sister's remains, where it was discovered that their DNA did not match suggesting she may have been one of the stolen babies during Franco's rule. Maria's DNA is now registered in several databases as she continues the search for her sister. Pilar Navarro In 1973, eager to establish a family, Pilar gave birth at a private Catholic hospital in Madrid. But her nurse, a nun, informed her and her husband that the baby had passed away from respiratory problems less than 24 hours after birth. The hospital had already christened and buried the child, so the young couple was unable to see the body. Pilar said she didn't understand why a nun or doctor would act in such a way. It wasn't until 2011, when tens of thousands of accounts of Spain's stolen babies surfaced, that she began to wonder if her daughter might also have been taken and found it unsettling how much of her story resembled the ones she read. Spain never owned up to its wrongdoing. Instead, it took the exact opposite action, passing a wide amnesty bill that exonerated members of the regime of the majority of their prior misdeeds in the years after Franco's death. Although amnesty was not explicitly offered to individuals guilty of the kidnappings, the police did reflect a consensus that had developed after Franco's rule, which was to avoid facing the ominous legacy of the dictatorship. The Pact of Forgetting was the moniker given to the deal, all political sides in Spain advocated for peaceful democracy even at the expense of calls for justice. 
Furthermore, there has been no official acknowledgement of what happened in the hospitals for the abducted babies of the time. The government and church have not expressed regret for the abductions, no obvious place to start looking for solutions either. Ana Pintado and Maria Robles, like many others, would have to take on the role of the investigator in the investigation into their kidnapping and find the parents they had never met. It also did not help their case when Inez Madrigal, the first person recognized by Spain to be a stolen baby, was discovered to have been adopted and not stolen after all. How easy it is to commit a crime and tell the victims who are still feeling the backlash and impact several decades later to forget it ever happened and move on. There has been no acknowledgement of what had been done and hardly any assistance for the victims in locating their birth parents. Do you think it's high time governments are called to pay for their crimes against humanity? Because the more we allow them to get away with injustice and wave it away or cover it up, the deeper we fall into a circle of terror and pain with no way out. Let me know what you think in the comments section below.